Welcome to the talk Open Trackers for Open Science with Daniel Gavins, Daniela Gavins, and here. Yeah, have fun. <laughs> okay, hey, um, uh, welcome everyone. And I see people are actually trickling in. So perfectly, perfect that we waited for a few minutes. Um, so I'm Daniela Gavins. Um, I work at uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands as a PhD student, where I'm working on a project related to data mining and data science in general and very broad strokes. Um, I get into my research um, a little bit later. Uh, today, I'm going to present on open trackers for open science. What do I mean with trackers? I mean activity trackers. And then for open science, we'll look into a few definitions that there are and um, see um, what open science, oh, but what activity trackers, which impact acti activity trackers and the use of activity trackers um, in research as research devices can have um, on our perception of open science um, and, and doing open science with activity trackers. Where, when does it work and when doesn't it work and what do we need um, for it um, to work properly? If everything went well, you can see the second slide now, which is the outline of my talk. Um, I will start introducing what it means for us to work with activity trackers in behavioral research um, and in medical research. Um, then I'm going to give you a very brief overview of what hardware and software options currently exist and what people are using. Um, and then I will give you solutions to the problems that actually um, are attached to the current hardware and software options. Um, and then I'm going to ask the big question, what's next? Um, and there, I hope to get everyone involved um, in uh, thinking along of uh, what are viable options for um, activity tracking for research. But let's look at what activity trackers are. When I say activity trackers, I mean those wrist-worn variables, uh, variable devices. And to see if people are only locked in or are actually listening, um, I want to ask you one question, which is, are you wearing an activity tracker at the moment? Um, and we have a poll option, which is open right now. So let's see if... Uh, people are answering. Yes. Yes. Let's see. So this is half half, I guess, um, for now, what we see. Yeah. Well, I don't wear any. Um, I don't even wear a watch. Um, but yeah, so this is very much. Can, can you maybe drop in the, in the public chat what kind of variable you were using? That'd be also super interesting. I'll close the poll. I did not close the poll. I am. Um... Anyone um, want to share what kind of um, variables they're using? Gorman, yeah. Anyone with Apple Watches? Probably not. Anyone with an um, with a device um, running Asteroid OS? I was I was hoping to find people that work with um, that have a watch with an Asteroid OS on it, but yeah. All right. Um, now that we're a bit awake, let's dive into three personas. I want to share you uh, with you um, how participants in research experience um, using activity trackers in, for research. So um, I'm going to give you three personas and then we're kind of going to sort of um, walk through their um, what what they're experiencing um, when joining such research. So persona one is Mark. Mark has um, two children um, aged uh, eight years. Um, they are in primary school and they come home with a letter from their school 
with an invitation letter to join a um, a study where scientists from the from behavioral science faculty will um, join the kids on the playground and uh, take observations. So they will take notes, paper and pen. Um, they will also send around questionnaires and surveys that the children can fill in and that also the um, the, the parents will have to fill in. And um, the researchers say that they are going to outfit the children with a wearable that they will wear through, um, for one week um, during the day. So when the children come into school, they will get a wearable. And when they leave school, they will leave the, the wearable at school. So this is persona one. Persona two um, is Janine. Janine is just out of prison. She has a story or history of um, being in and out of prison, actually. Um, and her coach, so, so she's working with a coach to um, sort of get out of the spiral um, of, of uh, criminal behavior. With her coach, um, she found out that there's a few triggers um, that might lead to her behaving um, in a negative or unlawful way. Um, and those triggers are that she does not get out of bed for um, several days in a row and that they that she is in touch with a set of people that actually are sort of not good for her um, that will lead her back into criminal behavior. And so the, the coach tells her, maybe you should join a study where um, we are going to actually look, use a wearable watch and uh, um, a, a smartwatch. And uh, whenever these uh, triggers, so this not getting out of bed and contacting those set of people happens, um, someone will in your, um, someone that you, you trust or the coach will be notified. So it's a, it's a system where she wears the watch and um, a coach gets notified so that she does not spiral back into criminal behavior. That's persona two. Persona three is Carla. Carla, um, Carla's mom is actually in a nursing home because she has dementia and cannot live at home anymore. Um, and also here, there is the it's the case of an invitation letter um, by a university saying um, some researchers are interested in how or how much activity uh, patients with dementia show. Um, if it's more sedentary behavior or very active behavior and uh, they want to use as well as with the children they want to use a variable device that um, uh, Carla's mom will wear during the day to track uh, not only the activity or the activity levels of hers but also where she is during the day and if she is using the park that surrounds uh, the nursing home so I hope the three studies are more or less clear. So we have um, the left one here, Mark, who is the dad with two kids in primary school. There we want to use the variables to um, check how children are playing on the playground, what they're doing the entire day. Um, we have Janine who might want to use the watch to um, check if um, some criminal behavior might reoccur or not. Um, and we have Carla where it's about the dementia care patients and how much um, activity they display during the day. So my question, and I'm going to leave this here in the chat as well, is what do you think are the biggest alarm bells? Like if you were Carla and were asked to um, outfit your mom with a watch, what would be the big um, alarm bells that would start ringing in your head? Um, and would gi would you give people um, uh, would you give uh, the people uh, the, the researchers would you allow them um, to use a watch on your mom or on your child? Um, would you yourself use a watch if you were um, in in such a coaching process? And what do you want to know? Um, 
what what more information do you need to decide so if you I, I i see that one person definitely has found the way to the hack md um you can just uh, click on the link and um, um edit the md and i can see that for the children's behaviors project there's already people editing um The behavioral impact on the child, yeah. Um, ch children getting used to tracking, so that, that's an interesting one, actually. I didn't, haven't thought about that one. Um, that children could just get used to wearing such a watch um, and um, being like followed, um, so to speak, by someone else. Yeah, uh, privacy data sharing um, is something that is um, definitely interesting. And regarding the dementia care project, um, someone is writing about the consent. Um, will she um, understand or will the mom then understand um, the consequences of the research? Yes. Um, interesting. Okay, I'll leave the, the, the HackMD, we can leave it open um, and see who, who else um, or if people want to contribute later. Oh, there's one more. Um, yeah, so um, I, I guess someone wrote um, split between groups of parents. So probably that one parent group um, says, yes, let's do the thing with the watches. And another group says, no, let's not do that. OK. Um, you might be wondering if people actually come up with such studies and really want to conduct them um well i'm one of those um so i'm working um on the dementia care project where we're interested to find out um how much dementia care patients actually move during the day so much how much activity do they display and um we also want to know um, if and how they're using a park that surrounds the nursing home um, and the clue or the the interesting point here is um, that this nursing home is actually going to open the doors of the dementia care unit so that um, patients that are usually locked into their um, care unit and cannot leave that unit without uh, someone accompanying them um, are now free to leave that, that um, unit or that housing uh, residential complex um, and can use the park. And so this is, and, and no one knows really what, what's going to happen. So, so it's interesting to, to look at that. And we are looking into using uh, variables uh, for that research um, project. The children is also um, a project here in Leiden. Um, where up until now they're using mostly proximity sensors or only proximity sensors to find out um, which children are playing with each other on the playground. Um, and they also want to incorporate more information about how children behave uh, on the playground and also track where they are on the playground because it's um, interesting for them to find out more um, about unstructured playtime for young children and what that does to the children and the third one oh yeah the, the third one was the um was the um, ex detainee um we have here um a organization called exodus and uh, they worked actually with the um, horus school in amsterdam on a project uh, where they um, wanted to find out or design a, a variable device that would give ex detainees sort of a feedback on how they're doing with um, their um, own goals um, and the goal being mostly staying out of prison um, so uh, so these projects actually exist the, this is what i want to do this is, like, this is what i want to get across the, the baseline is those projects assist 
people want to use activity trackers um, for various reasons. Um, some of these reasons are on the slide. Um, A, the tracking of activity of heart rate, location, interactions, but also um, something that is called moment, momentary emotional assessment, which is um, short questions that are being asked um, at various times per day or various times per week. Um, and people are asked how they're doing, basically. Then the trackers are attractive because they are passive and almost non-intrusive. Wearing a watch is something that you can ask people to do. Um, you can use them for longitudinal studies or for several weeks. Um, and they will gather real-life data. And real-life data is um, data that is collected outside of the lab and that is very rich. It's also not the most beautiful data to work with because it comes with all kinds of noise but it's very, very rich. Um, so yes, people want this data and people want to work with the variables for these reasons. Let's look at our, the three projects that I just um, mentioned as to what kind of data we want to collect and what the participants are. Um, and the data that we want to collect is um, some sort of activity data, which um, we can infer, for, infer from accelerometry. Um, EMA, so the emotional momentary assessment, would be something that might be implemented in the children's project. Location information would be something that we're looking at in all three projects. And then for the ex-detainees, something like call logs or messaging logs would be interesting. For the part, when we, if we look like when we look at um, the participants' age, we can say that the children are generally well younger than thirteen. They're all primary school kids. Um, for the ex-detainees, it's anything. The range is pretty big. And then we have our ge geriatric patients um, that are well over sixty and uh, sixty-five. Um, most of them, anyways. And then we have, I have two more um, points of information that are um, coming in at a later stage, which is somatic health and mental health. For the children, um, we can assume that they are mostly healthy. There are hard of hearing children in that, in some of the classrooms. Um, and then for the ex detainees, we would say they're probably generally healthy. Um, in the nursing home, we have old people. So they, they are geriatric patients. They will have heart conditions, for example. They will have mobility um, that is um, uh, somehow uh, limited. Then from the mental health aspect, um, again, the children, we have some special education school, schools in the data collection um, uh, process there. Um, so that can influence how people are moving, um, what kind of uh, movement patterns they show. For the ex detainees the chances are that you get uh, psychiatric patients in there. Um, not all of them will be, but some might. And in a nursing home, it's a dementia care project, so there are um, yeah, people with dementia in, in, that, um, in that group. Now, before I will pre I present what kind of solutions there are or what kind of, say, big tech solutions are often used, I want to say that not, I want to say that there are good reasons for using big tech. Um, and some, and we need to know the reasons why people are using those big tech um, solutions to do better with an open source solution. Um, so I'm not here to bash Apple. That's basically what I want to say. First up are our medical research devices. Medical research devices give us high quality of the data. They give us access to the raw data. Um, they are um, tried and tested. The biggest problem here is that they are really um, made for um, for lab experiments or controlled environments 
plus the medical research devices um, usually only track one one sense like they have one sensor or two senses max um, they are not smart watches they are usually very bulky um, yeah bulky boxes basically that you wear on your wrist on the other side we have consumer grade devices and I um, sort of uh, summarize them per platform that they're using I hope that makes more or less sense um, so we have Apple Watch, Fitbit and Garmin, the big three. And then we have Android watches. Um, we have uh, Tizen, um, so that's Samsung um, watches, or the Tizen platform used on Samsung watches. Um, and we have Astroid OS. Uh, first up are the big three, because most research that's being done is um, done with those big three. And I'll be very brief here um, because also time. Um, so Apple Watch. Um, you can use an Apple Research app, um, which some universities are actually using or collaborating with, with Apple. It's probably pretty difficult to get into such a program. Then we can use the health kit and care kit frameworks that they are offering. Um, here you have access to all kinds of health-related data from the users. The um, it is limited to a specific set of tasks that um, users can do uh, and yeah, limited to the health data that, that's being shared um, throughout the platform. Uh, you could also build your own application for Apple Watch. Um, here again, you're limited um, by the certification process that, that you have to go through to actually launch the app. So, for example, background um, logging um, in the background at high frequency could drain the battery so much that they would not allow you to certify the app that you're that that you're developing. Um, Fitbit Fitbit uh, works together with Fitabase, and Fitabase is a company um, doing yeah providing help to researchers to use Fitbit as a research device. You can use their web API and you can bulk download information um, per user. So you could basically um, open a user account per participant and then ask the participant to send you the data or um, download it for them. That would be an option. Um, the, both the web API and the Fitabase um, solution have the problem or the, the um, limitation that you cannot get data at a very high granular level. Um, it's actually quite coarse. Then um, Garmin, also Garmin works with Fitabase. Um, also, they have a web API. It's called Health API. Um, and they also offer a health SDK. The, the SDK allows you to um, write native apps for Garmin watches. Um, I did not look into the SDK. <laughs> so um, that's that. The um, big downside of using these big, big tech approaches is the granularity um, on a temporal level. So for example, you would only get a heart rate measurement or estimate per minute instead of per 10 seconds you would um, get a maximum of accelerometer data or no access to raw accelerometer data and only to the compounds. Um, and with the compounds, I mean um, the activity classifications that are usually done, as in the activities such as swimming, walking, sitting still. And so th those are the compounds that I mean. And um, so the granularity is, is very limited um, in, in these approaches. You have web APIs that you can use, but you, then you depend on the tech companies actually allowing you to use the web APIs. Um, and if they are shutting down those APIs, then you don't get your information anymore. Um, and possibly certification issues. For example, if you're draining the battery too much, though you might not care draining the battery because 
you only need information for one and a half hours. Um, but yeah, so this is just certification issues that can come along. What is it that draws people still to using Fitbit or to using Garmin? One is the availability and scalability of research. Um, so for example, we have in, in Germany, you have coronadatenspende.de, which um, allows people to share their health related data with um, a national institute. Um, and they want to estimate um, how Corona is spreading throughout uh, Germany um, uh, on a temporal and spatial component. They can use this. They, so the idea here is that you have, if you have enough people joining um, this uh, Corona Datenspende.de um, data collection, and if there is a signal in all of these compounds, then you will find it. That that's basically the idea. Um, and they can use this because there's just so many people using a Fitbit or a Garmin. Um, another um, reason for using um, a consumer variable is a design, is, is the design choice. And here I want to quote actually from a paper um, written two years back um, where they worked with uh, psychiatric patients. And so they write to enhance acceptability and minimize user burden and stigma, uh, widely available consumer oriented technologies were therefore considered. So they talked to their participants, suggested a few variables um, amongst which also uh, the medical uh, research devices mentioned earlier. And, and then the user groups favored the risk run fit with charge uh, due to its appearance as a lifestyle device as opposed to a medical device that is acceptable to both younger and older users and the ability to view metrics um, related to sleep activity um, via the Fitbit app. So here um, they work together with their um, with, with the uh, participants and decided to use something that gives the participants more than just being um, a tracker. On a similar note, I want to mention again the compounds. So what I mentioned before that you don't get raw data, but you get like um, activity, sleeping, activity, walking or running or swimming. Um, so is it that we can use those compounds to do research? And there the question is, what is your intent? Um, so um, in the same paper, the authors um, write, we suggest that those variables, those devices um, actually work for clinical um, prediction, depending on the questions that you're asking. Our goal is not to draw conclusions about, so in this case, it was only about sleep, about sleep parameters such as total sleep time or sleep efficiency per se, because if they were interested in sleep time or sleep efficiency, they might use something else, something that is validated. But rather, our objective is to ask whether changes um, in longitudinal rest activity patterns at a within person level uh, captured using a variable device. Uh, predicts deterioration in clinical status. So they are wondering how changes over a long time period um, predict deterioration um, in the in the patients. Um, they were not interested in how someone is sleeping, but how sleep patterns as approximated by the Fitbit um, actually uh, help them predict uh, behavior or uh, uh, an episode of, of psychosis. So it's about the intent, basically. Same goes for the Corona Datenspende. So here um, you can see that they're collecting all kinds of information here, how many 
um, steps you've taken, um, how many calories burned, um, how many flight of stairs you've taken. All of those are a compound information of something that you get out of the watch that you cannot really validate or you don't know if it's validated. Um, it's an approximation of activity in general. Uh, and here at the Corona Datenspende, as I mentioned before, if there is a signal, you will find it. That's the hope anyways. So in summary, we have solution for lab studies. Um, so that's the medical devices. They are bulky, but precision technology. We have solutions for big data studies. Um, widespread consumer grade bed devices. <clears throat> you have access to summary statistics. Perfectly fine. For real life data collection. Yes, if the intent is in agreement with what you're getting from the watch, then you can use the, the technology that is available. Now, um, when we look at our case studies, the biggest problem I see is that we have age groups here that are below 13 and above 65. I don't know how the compounds, so these activity classes, are generated. I don't know if they are trained on kids' data or on elderly data. For the elderly, we have geriatric patients. So if we're looking at heart rate estimations, for example, it might be difficult if you have a heart condition or if many people in your study population have a heart condition. Um, we have dementia care patients, so their movement patterns might be completely different um, from a healthy uh, population. So when we're looking at the compounds, not much we can do uh, with these in, in, in these case studies. And then there was this privacy issue, right? So when we looked at the alarm bells, where is the data going going um where is the data going with whom is it shared um do i have access to the data who else has access to the data um and so i think for the privacy part um there's two questions that we should ask is um which path does the data take from the variable to the computer of the researcher and then Another question that we have to ask is the privacy statement between the participant and the producer or the company, or is that a privacy statement between the researcher and the producer? And this is something um, that any researcher has to take up with their privacy officer. Um, and not all privacy officer officers know a lot about clouds, for example, about um data being sent around all kinds of service to then end up on the researcher's uh, laptop so um say from own experience i would say um take time and 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 uh, plan ahead um to talk this through with your privacy officer so at last, open science. I promised it at the beginning, and um, now I have another ten minutes or so to actually dive into the um, into the open science part of my talk. So, the definition by Foster um, is: open science is the practice of science in such a way that others can collaborate and contribute, where research data, lab notes, and other research processes are freely available under terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and reproduction of the research and its underlying data and methods. Let's look at this definition or take it apart. We want to collaborate and contribute. Big question is, can you collaborate, can you contribute if a research is really locked into, into a closed project, basically? where you don't have access, such as um, 
an Apple Watch, um, an Apple Research um, project. Um, I would say it's very difficult um, to yeah, collaborate and contribute on such a project. Next question is, um, or the next point here is, under terms that enable reuse, given that we're talking here about proprietary data and models, proprietary um, but, yeah, access to the data, so that, that, I mean, that's the definition of proprietary, um, the, the terms are not open. That's basically it. And then the question is redistribution and reproduction um, of the research and its underlying da data and methods. Um, trying to reproduce something that is built on a black box algorithm on a model or on a compound, whatever you want to call it, um, will be very difficult because you don't know if, for example, this black box algorithm changes with updates of the watch. So say you have a longitudinal study, you, you um, have users um, use a Fitbit for like two years um, and they um, update their watch. It could be that the model that predicts how well you sleep changes over those two years. So you don't have a consistency there. Um, that's not what you want if, if you want to estimate any effects there um, in the data. So it's a no-no actually for, for when, you, when you look at it um, from a robustness point of view. Um, that being said, not every research project that so research projects do not need to be open science to be good research project, projects, right? So there are reasons um, or situations where you cannot adhere to the standards um, that I just mentioned, and they are still good and valuable research projects. But this is under the assumption that you want to do open science or open science as much as possible. I'm not the first one or the only one thinking about these things. Um, there's, for example, a preprint um, by Nelson et al. from this year on um, how to use um, heart rate in uh, biobehavioral research. And um, they have also a few good, a list of, of, of considerations that, that um, is very good. So, um, if you remember the very one of the very first slides, there are three more um, hows that I did not mention yet. And now we're getting into the discussion with you as um, yeah, as listeners, as my audience. Um, how can we open up those trackers? And how can we um, open them up in a way that they allow for open science uh, methodology or open science approaches? Moderation. So the microphone, so I can talk if you like. Um, yeah, give me another two minutes and I'll oh, okay. Use the three um, things and then we can open up the discussion, I think. Okay. Yes, cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, so the first one is um, Wear OS or Android for wearables. Um, it's kind of, I'm, I'm saying it's a cheapish option because there are just many wearables out there that run um, um, Android. Um, I found this app here, Vada, which can track accelerometer, gyroscope, and the light sensor. It's uh, just a package and can be installed offline with no accompanying phone. So I found that very attractive. I didn't try it yet. So um, maybe there's people in, in the group that have tried um, this or, or another um, um, app on, on their Android watches. And I'd be interested to know if this really works um, without having to connect. Um, or to send information via an accompanying um, phone app. 
Um, yeah, well, you will be locked into this, the version of your, oper uh, of your, into one version of your operating system that uh, is on the hardware. Um, but that is probably something that, that we have to get used to. Um, the hardware and firmware is a bundle. It's a package that like sort of, yeah, you don't really get it out of each other, uh, apart, teasing apart, it's difficult. Um, again, Android watches, you could probably also bulk download health data, possible. Question again is, um, do you want to force your participants to have um, a Google account just to get their health data and share it with you? My guess is no. Um, that would be my first reaction to it anyways. Um, then I want to present our little homebrew. Um, we used um, a Samsung watch and um, had, oh, there is text missing here. That's not nice. So uh, to the left, you see a watch. This is supposed to be a watch. Um, to the right, this is supposed to be a laptop. And we have a watch, um, a device app, and we have a um, command line interface for the laptop. And this is how the two communicate with each other and they communicate via a local network. And the nice thing is that this gets us raw data. So we can actually do data science, which is great because that's what I'm supposed to do for my research. Um, and the cool thing is that it's possible to extend um, to Bluetooth or proximity tracking, something like a heart rate, um, and um, emotional momentary assessment because it's basically a smartwatch and people can also interact with the watch. And the negatives is that it's still under construction and it has taken us a long, long time. You need good programmers um, to come up with a good solution here. Um, it's all programmed in C. And um, so the first bulk of the work was done um, by third year bachelor students um, at our institute as part of their software engineering course. And then we have secured two of the students to work um, for us as student assistants and, and continue um, work on the command line um, interface mainly. Um, but yeah, it's for behavioral researchers, but for behavioral scientists, it's not easy to find programmers um, who, who can do that work for them. Um, and also the two students that we um, included in, in working um, for us, um, they are doing that not for the money because we can not afford too much. Like we have a, a standard pay rate for student assistance and that is much lower than what they would get outside of the university. But they are doing it because they like the open source idea behind it. Um, so, getting people to support you here is very difficult um, certainly for field researchers um well and we are with our solution we are locked into samsung devices that's yeah that's a, a problem or maybe not but that's how it is um question asteroid os is also an option um from what i understand there's only limited lifestyle apps there what other disadvantages are there regarding Asteroid OS? This is something that I really want to know um, from the community um, uh, or from people here that are listening. Um, we are, there is in Leiden or in the Netherlands, um, we're kind of working towards the idea of having such an open um, platform. And I already see that someone has um, shared. Do you hear the rain in, in the background? I have lots of rain and it's really loud. I hope, uh, Ormo, do you hear me well still? Yes, I'm hearing you well and I don't hear the rain. Okay, good. <laughs> then I just continue working with it. It's really hard rain here. Um, okay, so um, just very, very quickly, um, the mission of our little group that we came up with is to 
be or create an independent community of researchers and other stakeholders, evoking a cultural shift towards more sustainable research. Um, and this community works towards a common toolkit, whatever and however that will look like, which is transparent, flexible to use and open for improvements and change. Um, sustainable research is better privacy, adaptable design, affordable and transparent. Transparency allows everyone in the community to take their own decisions and draw their own conclusions about the product. So have this control about their own, yeah, the, the control is basically um, important. Um, and this is um, a mission that we worked on together with a few, a bunch of people from the variables and practice community in the Netherlands. So, now I talked a lot for, for about 45 minutes or something like that. Um, I hope my story made some sort of sense. And I want to ask you another poll, which is, is a truly open activity tracker an option? Like, is that something that we should look into or should we just forget the idea? Um, and let's make it a yes no and you can fill in um open as you want to fill it in um yay people are for it so you know that i'm gonna ask how to do that in a while right um yeah so we have like eight people saying okay this this is absolutely an option so now the question is, is it worth exploring the Asteroid OS plus custom smartwatch? Do you think that this is something, and now, oh, how do I close the poll and open the poll again? Um, or more help. <laughs> How yeah. do you do by the last time? Yeah, but then I now I'm getting the um, oh, published polling results. Maybe once I publish them, maybe I can open a new one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so eight people said um, yes, it's um, worth exploring the asteroid OS, uh, the um, uh, an open an open um, approach. So um, now I want to know if it's worth to explore the Ostroid OS plus custom smartwatch. And it's again a yes and no. Um, and please also use the public chat if you um, think that maybe another combination um, is, is, is useful. Absolutely. <laughs> Asking the echo chamber here, everyone is like, open, open, but yeah. I like echo chambers, then you can get, <laughs> you get, you hear what you want to hear, right? Uh, anyways, um, let's go back to the poll. No, there is someone saying that um, the Asteroid OS plus custom smartwatch is not a good idea. Why is that? If you want to share that. Or maybe you don't want to share it, but I'd be very interested to hear um, who said no here. No. Okay, so the person who said no did not. Doesn't want to answer. All right. Um, yes, and then um, the, the third question has already been answered in the, in the public chat, I think. So I see here open hack um, as an idea and uh, GNU, GNU Health, um, which I don't know, but maybe um, we can open the, the floor to questions and everyone, because we're only 10 people here. So 
Um, yes, can we do? I can enable the participation. Yes. So awesome. now you're unable. You can talk if you like, and or, or you write um, something in the chat if you like. Yeah, or raise your hand if that is an option in here. Um, yes, I think it is. So what I would be interested in is um, Sai Revolt, if he, she is still here. They are still here. Um, the GNU Health, is that um, a project in Europe or in, like, how do you know about it? Ah, okay, so you actually know a person who works on it. Okay, perfect. I'll definitely um, dive into that. Is that in the in Germany? Is that a German uh, project? Ah, okay, super. Um, yeah. So thanks a lot for sharing that. Um, also, Open Hack is um, is being shared here. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a, a slide anymore. I'm I'm done. I didn't even <laughs> attach a um, a slide on how you can contact me or if um, how to contact me is not included. But you can send me an email, and um, my name is on the first slide. And I think there's not so many Daniela Gavins, um, certainly not in Leiden at university. Ormo, do you, I don't know how usually people are uh, doing this with questions. Um, yeah, normally it is so that the people can write something or they can ask something if you like. So they yeah. can yeah. Um, unmute their microphone and ask the question or write it down in the chat, please. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I just left my email address in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. Um, for that. Um, I hope my, my story made a little bit of sense. Um, I honestly had problems in how to structure it uh, in a way that sci like behavioral scientists, developers, and people doing data science kind of understand the entire jazz because i find it a, a quite multifaceted problem um but yeah that was the challenge today i guess so if nobody have a question maybe i have one which trade are you using personally uh no so i don't use any any device any trackers okay. um because i i don't really <laughs> not trust them. <laughs> I, I might I might trust them, but I don't wear watches, so I okay. I would never wear one. That that's okay. That's the main thing. Um, but would you recommend one of the trackers? Uh, for private use, I never looked into them. I okay. I. No. Um. Okay, there's a question. Did you start? In the yeah, chat? So I'm wondering whether we have more people in the group who have used or program program variables for research. Yes. Yeah. Is there um, research uh, software engineers maybe in here in the group uh, listening in? I'm sorry. Yeah, not too much yet. Um, software engineer. Yeah. Yeah, I find it. I find it is very um, difficult to find um, sort of app, because app development seems to be really a subgroup of of developers, and and finding them to also communicate with researchers, I find that very tricky. Um, so. Uh, Yes. Yeah. The okay. So I, I have to read out the the questions from the chat. Um, what I can say is that the closed state of the hardware doesn't help very much. We would need more lower level access. Um, and then yeah, the firmware project, and the firmware the, or open firmware. Um, 
Definitely. Um, I think, no, I might have skipped that, um, which is, um, so whenever you're deciding for um, a platform, you're, you're deciding basically for a bundle that combines the hardware, the firmware, the, what else is there, the operating system, the software stack that is on the operating system. So you sort of decide for such a, a sandwich or, or some, yeah, a, an entire bundle that you can very hard take apart or tease apart. And um, I think that that is the main question. Um, so, uh, or this is the main problem that you're not use like you're not deciding for I want sensor A and um, operating system B, but you're really deciding for for a bundle. Great. Um, so yeah, thanks for your feedback. I oh, how much? I don't know what SPS is. So someone is asking how much SPS do you need for analyze? Oh, sam oh samples per second. Okay. Um, uh, uh, the data scientist in me says as much as possible. So um, go as high uh, her, uh, as possible. Um, so for the um, accelerometer data and the gyroscope data, we're going at 50 hertz, I think. So 50, uh, measure, 50 pieces of information per second. Um, for the GPS location information, um, that depends on how quick the people are walking and um, yeah, how quick they are. For the children, we're going probably at a higher sampling rate than um, for the old, older people, um, for our um, residents at the nursing home. Um, which, by the way, um, doesn't mean that all nursing home residents are very slow. They are, some of them are very quick. So um, yeah. Um, okay, then I have one more uh, comment here. Agree, close statement, uh, close say problem. We need more funding for um, people power to do the open thing. Um, in this echo chamber, are there any ideas for funders? And, um, yeah. So if, do you know funding possibilities? Anyone knows about funding possibilities for open hardware projects or, yeah, oh yeah, probably open hardware for science projects. I know that there's Mozilla's open hardware program, I think it's called. Um, any others? Other ideas for funding? m and reform. And the, just one question again for Ormo. The public chat is not recorded anywhere, right? So I would have to just... That's right, correct. You it. have to write your notice. Or you can copy paste it if you like. Okay. I think you have the rights for this. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So, but, but you have to do it before I have to close the session so that you okay. have it in mind. But yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, yeah. There's someone taking notes already. Perfect. Um, I think my time is up. So, I, I really don't want to keep people here. Um, and I think there's also people already dropping out um, for longer than needed. Um, yeah. Thanks a ton for, for the feedback. Um, or and or the the information shared in the in the chat that was very useful definitely for us. Um, yeah, you can send me drop me an email. You can um, find me on Twitter if you're interested um, in our research there, and then you pretty quickly find all the other people that are um, in that um, say working group on open trackers um, in the Netherlands. That is. Um, and yeah, yeah. Thanks for Frostcon to invite me or to allow me to <laughs> to give a presentation on Saturday. Also, 
Yeah, thank you very, very much for your lovely talk, um, Daniela. And um, yeah, normally you'd give it applause. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have yes. here. But maybe the person have to like to make your microphone on and can clap, but uh, nobody have to. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.